Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of The Dean Show, which is a way of life. We try to put out there for everyone to see, helping you understand Islam and Muslims. And today I have a very special guest, Abdul Rahim Green. So you don't want to go nowhere, we're going to be right back to cover a very hot topic. So sit right there, we'll be right back on The Dean Show. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, man. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Thank you for being with us today on the oh, Dean Show. It's a pleasure, bro. We're going to get straight down to the topic. Let's go. You used to be a former Christian. That's right, yeah. Now you actually help educate Muslims on Islam. Yeah, that, that I try. Along with non-Muslims, of course. Yeah, that of course, yeah. Yeah. Now, today it seems like it's a taboo to talk about God. But you know what? It's the hot thing to talk about sex, drugs, rock and roll, music. All these things are things that are talked about in the social, sh social gatherings. But when you want to bring up yeah. the why we're created, the true existence of the human being, why he's been created, why he's here, it seems like, you know what, I haven't got time for that. Help us well, figure I, out why is this. I think people are scared, you know, um, some people are scared. It scares them because they, they sort of know that they're living a lie. I think people know, they all know that sex, drugs and rock and roll does not make you happy. They know deep in their hearts that wealth does not equal happiness. Um, and the moment you you bring up the topic of God, you bring up the to topic of religion, and the truth is whether you're a Christian or you're a Jew or a Muslim or whatever, you know, you, you're reminding people of the very thing that they're trying to run away from. So that's why they feel uncomfortable about it. You know, it, it's like, you know, when someone's doing something bad, um, or maybe, you know, you if you're that sort of person and you're doing a bad thing and someone comes to you and, and tells you, you know, you shouldn't do that. Well, some people, you know, they take it well, and they take that advice, and they take it on board, and they even appreciate that you've advised them. But most people start making excuses, you know, and they get uncomfortable, and, and they're sort of like, oh, don't talk to me, you know, leave me alone. Let, let me just get on with my bad life, you know, and stop disturbing me. And I think that's what it is, you know, when you bring up these topics, people feel uncomfortable, because um, they have to start looking at themselves and looking at their lives, and they don't want to do that. So what's the best way to approach someone and get their attention and to explain to them, to talk to them? Because in one way or another, somebody is mimicking somebody. And mm -hmm. usually they're mimicking the stars. I want to be mm -hmm. a star. I want to be mm -hmm. like this person that's on TV. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think the best way to deal with it is to, um, is to be persistent and to be friendly. I mean, if you approach people in a friendly way and you approach them in a manner that, you know, they believe that, you know, that you really are concerned about them. And you're talking about these things because these things are important uh, and that you don't want them to see, you know, their lives being messed up. So I think it's more to do with the tone and the attitude and the way that you talk. You know, I think what people find a bit stressful is if you just sort of come in sort of to like some evangelical, you know, um, in that sort of way, I don't think people like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I still think that, you know, at the end of the day, I think the truth is at the end of the day, when you, when you read the Qur'an, you will see that at the end of the day, the fact is that all the prophets were confronted with the fact that by and large, their people didn't listen to them and didn't like what they were saying and didn't want to hear what they had to say, especially the rich amongst them. You know, it's always the prophets met with resistance from the rich and the powerful people in society because they were the ones who felt most threatened by that message. Um, and so, you know, it, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to talk to people because we should, you know. It's up to Allah, He's going to guide who He wants to guide. 
but you know history has told us and it repeats itself that you know people living in that type of society tend to think that they're self-sufficient they tend to think that I don't need God I mean I, I've I've met Muslims mm -hmm. Muslims um, who they don't even really think of themselves as Muslims anymore you know they're so confused they're so messed up by this society and by the materialism they don't even know whether there's a God or not right but when you get down to it when you really get down to it it's not that they don't know there's a God it's not that they don't know that Islam is the truth. When you really get down to it, they just say, what do I need religion for? I have everything in my life. I've got a good job. I've got a nice, you know, uh, I've got nice everything. What do I need God for? What do I need religion for? You know, that's for people who don't have anything in their lives. And this is the problem. Wealth can easily make you arrogant. It can, you know, there's a saying in, in that Jesus is supposed to have said. Mm -hmm. He said it's harder for a, uh, it's it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to I, enter the kingdom of heaven. I think some of these preachers they miss the uh, this verse when they hit well, with the, you see, with the Rolexes. Mean, yeah, the, the, you're right, man. And I tell you, the thing is that Protestantism, yeah, uh, especially the type of Protestantism that is prevalent in the United States of America um, has a completely different viewpoint. They, they look at wealth as being a sign of God's favor mm -hmm. um, and, and poverty as a sort of sign of God's disfavor. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that couldn't be something that's further from you know the message of, of Jesus uh, that's very obvious in the Bible. I mean, you know, uh, and that has been the belief of Christians for, you know, uh, more than a thousand years. Uh, that 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 wealth was never really was always looked really upon as something, not really that good. Um, you know, so the the idea of materialism, of course, the Islamic idea, is that wealth is neither good nor bad. Um, that it's what you use it for that is the issue. You, wealth is good if you use it for good things and it's bad if you use it for bad things. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the Messenger of God, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, the final Messenger Muhammad. He, uh, he, you know, he warned us mm -hmm. about the dangers of the world and the things of the world. And in fact, he said he was more afraid for his, his ummah or his, his nation the, uh, the, he was more afraid for them that you know the world would be open to them and that temptations of the world would come to them that this was even more uh, dangerous for them than even the Antichrist and with all his trials and tribulations that the world is a real temptation to take one away from from the religion um, but on the other hand, Islam is not a monastic religion. It's not a religion that teaches to, you know, abandon the world and leave the things of the world. I mean, you know, you can enjoy the things of the world as long as they, you know, you use them in a way that is halal, that is lawful, that's within the, you know, teachings of the Islamic law. And, uh, and as long as you're grateful, you know, as long as you're grateful and you're thankful to God. And so if something, you know, if you have a nice car, and you thank God and you praise God and, 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 and you use it for something that is good, that's, that's not a problem. You know, if you have nice clothes and, and you're grateful to God because of that, that's fine. It's when they make you arrogant. It's when you think because you're driving a nice car and you have nice clothes and you have a nice house that you're better than other people and that somehow makes you superior, mm -hmm. then that's what, that's, that was, that's what destroys you. Uh, and so ultimately what is important here is the character that you have, the condition of your heart, of your soul, that you are humble uh, and that you are grateful to God and that you, you recognize your sins as a human being and, and that you ask God for forgiveness. This is the type of character that a believer should have, that a Muslim should have. And, and wealth, it seems, you know, does, it has a tendency anyway to corrupt that. It has a tendency you know, to make people feel that they don't need God. You know, I've got everything. So mm -hmm. it has that implicit danger in it. You know, and it's just something we have to be be careful about. How about someone who's gotten in a, a routine, like you said earlier, self-sufficient, and now, mm. you know what, they say, I'm a good person, mm. I believe in God, mm. but I have to do my thing. I have mm. to party on the weekends. I have mm. to have 
a certain amount of girls during the week, and mm -hmm. this is their primary focus in life? Well, I mean, you know, then, you know, one thing contradicts the other, you know, because good, for us, good is not defined by what you decide is good or what, you know, Joe Bloggs decide, decides is good or even what the Houses of Parliament or the White House or Congress or whoever decides what is good. Good is defined by God. God is the one who decides what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong. You know, otherwise we just make our own morality up for ourselves. We can just make up for ourselves. You know, we do anything we like and say, I'm a good person. You see, this is, I mean, that's a very, this is a very interesting topic altogether. Because you find that, you know, most people, if you think about it, you know, there is a sort of, you could imagine graphically there's a sort of circle, right? If this circle represents the normal mode of behavior of people in society. So anything inside the circle is, you know, everything inside that circle is just, that's how people normally behave. So as long as you do things with inside the circle, then people would say they don't think of you as a bad person because you're just doing what everybody else does, yeah. right? But the moment you move outside of that circle, all right, then you could either be described as being a religious person, all right? because you've moved outside of the circle. You're not mm. normal anymore. You're yeah. religious, right? Or you could be described as an evil person from the other extreme, yeah. right? Because, you know, again, you've moved outside the circle. But if you think about this circle, it's totally random, and it depends completely upon which society you live. So the circle in Nazi Germany, right? Mm -hmm. If you took Nazi Germany, what's the circle in Nazi Germany, right? Well, if you're inside the circle in Nazi Germany, you're a Nazi, you hate Jews, you think it's a good idea to put them in concentration camps and, you know, burn them to death. Or if you were a Serbian, you know, in the, uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia, raping, killing and murdering Muslims, if you're inside that circle, that's considered to be good. So I think most human beings would recognize that that's not acceptable, that those can't be considered things to be good. And like I often say to people, I say, okay, you say, you know, there's nothing wrong with me, I'm okay, I'm a good person, I'm, and I'm not religious, right? But I mean, you know, so in 20 years' time, if you think it's a good idea to start locking, locking up Muslims and putting them in concentration camps and maybe exterminating them, and uh, you'd be inside that circle, you'd be doing that. So what is that? Does that make you good still? Because society says that's good? No, we don't hold by that type of random shifting morality where you know your idea of what is good changes from day to day and hour to hour, minute to minute. So having girlfriends is evil. It's destructive, it destroys you, it destroys the woman, it destroys society, it harms the family, it belittles the, the intimate act, the intimate sexual act, right? Which is, you know, which is not a bad thing. Sex is not a bad thing in Islam. You know, sex is a good thing, but it's good within the context of the husband and the wife. And they enjoy that relationship. And the act, the sexual act, the intimate act, you know, is something that is, is given by God, obviously for reproduction. That's one reason. But not only that, it is something that brings the man and woman close together. It is an extremely intimate thing. And through that, they bond. And through that, they, they, they become close together. Now, if this act of sex is just treated like, you know, um, I don't know, like, you know, I have sex like I eat food. You know, whenever restaurant I, f I like, whoever I like, whatever yeah. I like, right? Then when it comes to marriage, what is there really to keep those two people together? What is there to reinforce to make that bond, okay, what we read the same books, we watch the same movies, you know, I mean, these are not things to keep a marriage going. And this is one of the dangers when, you know, when promiscuity becomes abundant, when people think that, you know, you can just have sex with anyone and whoever you like, then that, that we believe, that act, that intimate act has been created by God to be enjoyable and to be enjoyed but within the intimacy of marriage and that reinforces the marriage 
and it builds the marriage and it builds the relationship between the husband and the wife. So by forbidding that outside of that context, then you reinforce the family and you reinforce the relationship between the husband and the wife. This is the beautiful wisdom of Islam. This is the beautiful wisdom of God's guidance. And you could see that, you know, if, this is, if people in society only followed that, we would have stable families, we would have stable societies. But no, we live in a highly sexualized society, mm -hmm. you know, uh, where this intimate act is, is, you know, allowed in all sorts of directions that has not been approved of by God. Uh, not in the Quran, nor in the Torah, nor in the Injil, or in any previous revelation that God had sent to any prophets. Okay, so what we see in society is a, is a moving away from this, and, and I, I don't think it's right for a person to claim that I'm a good person when you're doing things that are evil things. You know, that, that's just, we can't accept that. Will winning the lottery or achieving a certain position, will that bring a person peace? Will that bring a person contentment in life? Nothing is ever going to bring a person peace and contentment in life except that they submit and surrender themselves to the will of God. Human beings have been created by God to follow His guidance, to implement and to live their life according to His perfect wisdom. That is actually how God has created us. It is therefore impossible to find true peace and happiness in anything except that because it goes anything except that goes against your nature it goes against the way you've been created so uh, no one will ever find true happiness in winning the lottery anyway even you know we could find lots of evidence from this in recent psychological for example surveys on psychology and what makes a person happy is something now that actually scientists are beginning to study and the interesting thing is that what they've discovered is that actually the most, the happiest people and the most satisfied people and the things that bring happiness and satisfaction are not the things that are most easy, they're the things that we have to work hard for. And it's actually even though the working hard and even though the trying to achieve it can be unpleasant, the ultimate end of it is a feeling of peace and satisfaction and happiness that is long-lasting um, and and so this is the reality and I think most people if you actually think about it if you really for example thought about your life and you thought about the things that really stay with you and that give you a feeling of happiness until now you'll find there the acts of kindness that you did and the things that you had to make an effort in order to do them, that you really sacrificed in order to be able to do that act of kindness and that act of goodness. You had to sacrifice something from your time, from your money, or whatever it may be. Yet, you, if you think back in your life, that brings you, that thing is what brings you the most lasting feeling of peace and contentment. And this is, of course, what Islam is teaching. Islam is a religion that teaches us to do good to be good and to do good. It's not merely a belief. It's not merely, I believe in Allah and I believe in Muhammad and I'm going to paradise. No. If you really believe in God and you really believe in the Prophet Muhammad and you really believe in the Day of Judgment, then you will do the deeds of a person who has that belief. And so this is the reality. With belief comes action. With true belief comes action. And so what is that action? It must be good deeds. And those good deeds are the things that brings lasting happiness and peace and tranquility. How does a person go about deciphering because you have so many religions claiming that they're the way, they're the, the truth, and some people even get going to a level saying that, you know what, all these religions mm. were created just to form some order with society. All this stuff is made up now. How do we deal yeah. with this? Well, I mean, you, could, you know, people can make all sorts of claims. Anyone can make a claim. You can claim this about religion, and anyone can come along and claim, yeah, I, you know, I've got a religion that's from God. But, you know, we say the proof is, in England, we say the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding, yeah. The proof is in the pudding, right? You know, it, it's like 
let's really see what's the reality. Okay. Um, so what we have to do is we have to examine it, we have to study it, we have to see. There has to be some criterion, there has to be some means of testing whether something is from God or not. We don't shy away in Islam from rational discourse, in fact quite the opposite. That's what we want to encourage. We don't believe in blind faith, um, but we believe that faith must be established upon some foundation. Um, and although the topic of how can we know that Islam is from God, how can we know the Qur'an is the word of God, how do we know Muhammad is a prophet, it is a very big topic, it's a large topic. But for example, the Qur'an gives us, just as one example, the Qur'an gives us a very interesting criterion. It says that if this book was from anyone else other than God, you would have found within it many discrepancies. Because if God knows everything and sees everything and is completely wise, then surely a book that is from God would reflect those attributes of God. So you wouldn't find that it has contradictions. You wouldn't find that it is historically and scientifically, for example, inaccurate. You would find, you would expect rather, that when God talks about the universe or when God talks about something in the natural world, it agrees with what is observable reality. Now we know that the state of knowledge concerning the natural world has changed dramatically, especially in the last hundred years. You know, things that you, you and me take for granted, the development of the human embryo uh, through various stages. Um, we all know about that, it's common knowledge today but interestingly enough, it wasn't common knowledge 150 years ago because some of those things were only known through powerful scientific instruments that are able to observe these things. So it's interesting if we go back to the time of the Greeks that there was a lot of speculation about maybe it was this and maybe it was that and yeah. most of it was wrong. Yet the Qur'an is a book 1,400 years old, yet it describes exactly the stages of human embryonic development. That's exactly the sort of thing we would expect from a book that is from God. We would expect that even if this book is 1,400 years old, when it talks about things that we know today to be scientific facts, we would expect it to be in accordance with those facts. And that's one of the things we find about the Qur'an, that historically it's accurate, scientifically it's accurate, it's consistent within itself. So. It, it gives us a sign, a clue, this is from God. We got one person out there, or m maybe mm. several, who now they've been tuning on to the Dean Show, mm. and finally they like what you have to say, and the other th things that we've mentioned on the show, and you know what, they've had all the women, they've had the money, they've had the status, they've had all these after parties and the material things, and you know what, they've realized that Islam is not about terrorism or terrorizing yeah. people. They're not about worshipping a man, a monkey, a cow. They know that Islam is about worshipping one God, Him alone without any partners. And you know what? They want to come to Islam. Can mm -hmm. you give them the invitation? We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the Dean Show. I'm your host, Jasser Qadi. We have a question from a questioner who basically says that he's been researching the various religions, uh, that he's read quite a lot about Islam, and it's really appealing to him. And he's asking, how then should I go about accept accepting Islam? What are the necessary steps that I have to do in order to become a Muslim? Well, we'd like to start off by saying that, Alhamdulillah, indeed Allah guides those whom He wills and those whom He is pleased with. And we as Muslims believe that each and every human being who is sincere and who is curious and who wants to learn the truth, we believe that that person will eventually be guided to the truth. In other words, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because God is so loving and caring, because Allah is so just and merciful, any human being who wants to receive guidance will receive it. Any human being who wants to accept the truth will find the truth. And so this is one indication that we find from this brother that he's been reading about the religions and he's come across Islam, he's read about it, now he wants to accept it. So how does one go about accepting Islam? The response is that we are not a superstitious religion. 
There is no ceremonial acceptance. There is no ritualistic mumbo jumbo that people don't understand. No, the actual acceptance of Islam is an act between you and the one who created you. It's an act that is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, of course, if you were to publicize this in a mosque, in a gathering, that's very good. But it is not a necessary condition. It is not something that is essentially required. Rather, it is just a simple sense, uh, act of common sense that when you have embraced a faith, you wish to join that community, you wish to announce your, your Islam in that community. But the actual act of conversion is simply the utterance of the testimony of faith. And the testimony of faith in Arabic, as you are, I'm, uh, I'm sure, very well aware because you've researched Islam, the testimony of faith is Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, which translates as I testify, I am fully convinced, I have no doubt, I am absolutely certain that there is no deity that is worthy of my veneration and worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I testify, I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the messenger of Allah. This is the testimony by which you accept Islam. Now, if you want to perfect this testimony, if you want to do the best things possible, you should purify yourself, take a bath, you know, wear good clothes, go to the mosque, go to your local community of Muslims, tell them you want to embrace Islam and, and do a public testimony of faith. But all of these are embellishments that are nice to have, but they are not requirements. You may embrace Islam in the privacy of your home. You may do it in a, 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 in a room where nobody else can hear you except for the one who created you. So this is the requirement. And if you want to perfect it, then as we said, uh, you should take a ritual bath to symbolize your purification, to symbolize that you have now entered a new facet, a new phase of your life, where you will be a pure person obeying the commandments of Allah, obeying the commandments of God. Now, after you have uh, accepted the testimony of faith, you should try to find your local mosque, your local community, so that you are aware of the events going on. Try to uh, attend various gatherings. Obviously, you should attend the mosque on Fridays. You need to start praying regularly, the five times prayer. You need to fast the month of Ramadan. You need to pay the charity to the poor. All of these pillars of Islam, you are very well aware because you have researched Islam. But the point is that with that conviction, with that testimony, the entire religion of Islam becomes obligatory upon you to act upon. Therefore, make sure that you are ready and prepared to accept this religion. Make sure you are intellectually, yes, I know this is the truth and I want to go ahead and accept it. If if you are still unsure, if you're still doubtful, research, ask around, pray, pray to the God who created you. Don't even give him a name. Say, oh, you who created me, guide me to the truth. And if you are sincere, then we as Muslims believe that you will indeed be guided to the truth. Now, a brief explanation of what this testimony is. The first part of the testimony is the conviction that there is no deity that is worthy of worship except for the one who created you. The one who created you is the one who is all knowledgeable, all powerful. He hears you wherever you are. No being loves you as much as the one who created you, not even your mother and father. No being cares about you. No being has the power to help you, benefit you, to prevent harm from you other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you know these facts, how then can you turn to others in worship? We do not turn to any other being, even the prophets of God, even the angels, even the saints. We believe in saints, we believe in holy men. We call them holy people, we believe in them. And only God knows who they are, but they are there. They, of course they're there. But even if they're holy, that doesn't mean they're gods. Even if they're pious, doesn't mean that they control the creation. So we don't turn to them, we turn to the one whom they turn to. If they're truly holy and pious, then they also turn to God. Therefore, if they turn to God, they become an example for us. We too turn to God. So the first part of the testimony is that I bear witness and I testify that there is no deity worthy of my worship other than Allah. All of my love and hope, all of my fear, all of my expect expectations will be singled out to this one God. And the second part of the testimony, Muhammad Rasulullah, means that I bear witness and testify that this particular human being, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Arabian Prophet, I testify testify that this human being was sent by God to be an example for me. Not to be taken as worship, not to be ascribed divinity, but to become a role model for us. He is a human like we are. He was born a normal birth. He ate and drank like we eat and drink. He married, he had children, and then eventually he passed away. He was not a God, but he was the messenger of God. He came to teach us the message. He came to show us the way. He came to set an example. 
And that example is a human example that we have to emulate, we have to copy, we have to take as our role model. So by saying, I bear witness and testify that Muhammad وسلم, is a messenger of Allah, what you're saying is that no human being is a better example for me. No human being is a better role model for me. As a father, as a leader, as a spiritual advisor, as a worshipper of God, as a husband, as a role model citizen, no human being is a better example than this human being. That is what you're saying. You are not making him into a God. You are making him into the best worshipper of God, the best servant of God. And so what this testimony symbolizes is that you need to study the messenger. You need to study his life and times. You need to study his actions and teachings. And when you study them, you then put them into practice in your daily life. These are the two fundamental testimonies of faith. Only God is to be worshipped, only Allah is to be worshipped, and He is worshipped based upon the methodology and the customs of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This was the answer to your very beautiful question. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you and me and all of us to the truth. I pray that He forgives us in this world and the next, and I pray that He showers us with His blessings and His mercy in this world and the one to come. And we'll see you next time. And until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you give them the invitation? Yeah, I, yeah, definitely I would invite you to testify and to bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except the one God, Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is certainly the messenger of God. That's it, simple as that. It's that simple. You know, when you know it, when you know there's one God, and uh, when you know Muhammad is the prophet of God, well, say it. You know it, so just say it. You don't have to jump in a pool, get dipped. And you, don't, you don't have to get baptized. You don't have to put on some special clothes. You know, uh, you don't have to do some funky stuff. <laughs> you know, you just have to say those words because that's what it is. You are testifying and bearing witness to something that you know within yourself. I mean, that's the beginning. Of course, you know, as a Muslim, you should do your best to try and live the the way of life the clean and the beautiful and the pure way of life uh, of a muslim but you know we're we're human beings we sin by night and sin by day and uh, the best of the sinners are those who repent so you know god didn't create us perfect like he's perfect he knows that we're going to make mistakes and uh, it what is important is that we are humble and we ask god for forgiveness and you know we keep trying that's what's important you know as long as we do that We'll, we'll reach God's good pleasure in this life and the next. And He's the most forgiving. He is the most forgiving. He forgives all sins. If you came to God with sins as big as the heavens and the earth and you asked Him to forgive you and you didn't make any partners with Him and you, you were calling upon Him alone, then not only will, will He forgive you, but He will replace your evil deeds with good deeds nearly as great as the evil that you did. That's how merciful God is. Thank you very much for being with us on the Dean Show. Inshallah, we look forward to having you again next time. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure, and I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. If you missed us on the TV in Chicago on the local cable station, all of our shows are on thedeanshow.com. That's T-H-E-D-E-E-N show.com. Thank you again for coming to The Source, and we'll see you again next time. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you.